Our second reader for this evening is Matthew Salesis, who I will now introduce and whose name I finally said right tonight. Excited. <clears throat> Matthew Salesis was adopted from Korea. His novel, The Hundred Year Flood, was an Amazon Best Book of September and Kindle first pick and a season's best selection at BuzzFeed, Gawker, Refinery29, and elsewhere. He has two books forthcoming, an essay collection in 2017, Own Story, and a novel in 2018, The Murder of the Doppelganger. His fiction and essays have been published in NPR's Code Switch, The New York Times, Mother Load, Salon, Glimmer Train, The Toast, The Rumpus, and others. His previous books include a novel in flash fiction called I'm Not Saying, I'm Just Saying, and a novella, The Last Repatriate. He is currently a PhD candidate in creative writing and literature at the University of Houston. I have an anecdote, if that's all right, if everyone will indulge me for a moment. Um, I remember at AWP this year, I was uh, walking around going to the presses that I really enjoy, and there is a press that I love called Nouvella. Um, they published The Last Repatriate, and I happened upon the table while Matt was there signing books, and uh, I was excited because um, we, we had been talking already with uh, Jamie uh, Poissant, who also knows Matthew, about... Um, well, could we bring this guy? Um, and uh, we, I, I got a copy of the book and I had him sign it. And I do this thing where uh, when I get nervous about meeting someone, I, I sort of say these odd deprecating things uh, about myself, you know? Um, and, I, and I did that and I said, um, oh, could you please sign this to the taller, less weird version of me? And, um, and Matthew signed the book, and I, I looked at the, the inscription later, and it said, um, Dear taller, less weird version of Jared, you have nothing on the real thing. And I, I found that so, so touching, and, and I knew then we're bringing this guy. So <laughs> please welcome Matthew Salasis. Thank you. That was, yeah, that's me. I feel like I'm a good person now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is great. This is such a great turnout. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to read with Kristen, too. This is a great opportunity. Uh, I'm going to start just by telling a couple of jokes, because this is going to be a very not funny reading. Uh, <laughs> and I know how those can be sometimes. Um, so. I started this book in 2004. I was living in Prague teaching, teaching English um, because I graduated with an English degree and no options, uh, except for to teach English in a foreign country. So I had this great job, though, where I full time was 20 hours a week. And I just kind of went around having conversations with people, one on one conversations and correcting their grammar, um, a job I'll never have again, but which was great at the time. And since I was the one setting the rules, I got to talk about whatever I wanted. And so I asked people to talk about the myths and superstitions of Prague. And I, I heard these great superstitions and great myths, and they really stuck with me. Um, and they kind of became the foundation of the book that I was writing uh, and would not finish for 11 years. Um, that's another story, I guess. And um, one of my favorites is this story of a person who never actually existed. His name was Yara Zimmerman. And when I was in Prague, they were doing a kind of pan-European vote uh, where each country was voting on the most important person in, in their history. Um, and so it was like Winston Churchill in, in the UK. Um, and in the Czech Republic, they voted in this person, Yara Zimmerman, who, didn't, who never existed. Um, and they wouldn't actually let them let them choose this person who never existed, but it was it just seemed like a perfect encapsulation of all the conversations I was having. Um, and so Yara Simmerman has, has his own theater in Prague, and you can go see plays about him all the time, and uh, he's, he was second to do a lot of things. Like, he was second to invent the light bulb. <laughs> and he, he invented the airplane cabin, but nobody had invented the airplane yet, so he had to wait for somebody to invent the airplane. <laughs> Uh, for his invention to be valid. And so I got really into these, and they, 
became part of the book. Um, and at a certain point, I started thinking like what I like about these myths and superstitions is also kind of what I like about bad jokes. And I've been a bad joke lover for a long time. And um, I became a father about four and a half years ago. And uh, now, now I feel very comfortable being a bad joke lover. But before, it was like really awkward because nobody expects anybody except for dads, apparently, to like bad jokes. But I've all loved them my entire life. And so I'm going to tell a couple of bad jokes um, just to start us off. And then I'll ease right into uh, a list of superstitions. So my favorite one is this. What is this? It's a flock of these. <laughs> and so I was telling these, I tell these jokes a lot because I like them so much. And I was telling this out of, out of, I think maybe my last location, and somebody was, afterwards came up to me and was saying, that's, you know, like, that reminds me of this other joke. And it was so good that now I'm going to tell this one. Um, now we have to think about what it, what it actually was. Okay, what is this? It's this, but dead. <laughs> that one's going in the next book. <laughs> so I'm just going to read from the beginning of this book and then um, another short scene from farther on. Um, so this is from chapter one, which is called Myths. One. Before his father came and flew him back to Massachusetts General Hospital in September of 2002, these are the things he learned in Prague. One, if someone sneezes while you're talking, what you're saying is true. Two, if your nose is soft, you're lying. Three, if you cut an apple in half and see a star, it's good luck. If not, it's bad. Four, if you step in shit, it's good luck. <laughs> Five, if you pour molten lead into water, you can tell the future from the form it makes. Six, if your hand itches, you'll get into a fight. Seven, if your nose itches, you'll get beaten up. Eight, if you pour something and it overflows, someone you know will get pregnant. Nine, I'm pretty sure that's how pregnancy works, right? <laughs> Nine, if you lift your feet for someone to sweep under them, you'll never marry. These are the things I learned to prove. Ten, to cry at the wrong grave, that's the Czech expression, means to bark up the wrong tree. Eleven, often the legends of Prague have to do with selling one's soul to the devil. Twelve, half of Prague will be destroyed by fire, half by water, and 13, when the Czech Republic is in its most desperate hour of need, a sleeping army under the hill Blanik will awaken and defeat its enemies. T wrote this list during his first week in the hospital. He woke on a wet pillow, and he scrambled over the railing of his bed and fell to the floor. He pinched his nose shut. Water rushed over him, thick and brown, but he could breathe. He stood and rested the back of his hand on his pillow. He cried in his sleep again. He smoothed down his dry hospital gown and went to the window. The river outside was the Charles in Boston, not the Voltava in Prague. He pressed a sheet of paper against the glass, blocking the view, and wrote until the words blurred. When a doctor knocked at the door, he touched the bandage around his head and told himself there was no flood. He was in Boston. The doctor switched on the x-ray board and they stared at the back of T's skull. Where T had been hit, the nerves had fused together in shock and the skin had knotted and died until a surgeon had to cut it off. T knew who had attacked him, probably. A check with an American name, someone T had called friend. He couldn't remember what exactly had happened. The impact had caused some rare brain damage. He couldn't tell dates or remember song lyrics. Are you listening? The doctor said. He stood on one leg and the doctor tested his balance. The solidity of the floor 
shifted like weather. For the second time that date, he was back in Prague. He was running naked under the fireworks on New Year's Eve, the wind slapping his chest. People pushed and sang and embraced, then the back of a glowing leg slipped through the crowd. A woman walked out of T's hospital room. But no one had been inside except the doctor and T. T started forward and his balance gave out. The doctor held him up, linking arms, and called for a nurse. The doctor said T had to want to recover. T had seen that leg, that calf, before. Where? Later that month, T would transfer to a rehabilitation center meant to reorient him to a world he'd never understood. He would stumble down the halls, searching for a ghost. He took to stopping other patients and prompting them with abstract nouns. They had to get used to every kind of bewilderment. Love, he would say, hands trembling, and someone willing might answer, what goes up comes down. Or, if you give a mouse a cookie. Regret, he would say, and someone might answer, a wish for a perfect life, or aging. Hate, he would say, and some would remember why they were there. Two, the day he decided to go to Prague, his girlfriend pulled him aside at a birthday party in Boston. The talk had turned to 9-11, Stop acting so tragic, his girlfriend said in his ear. For God's sake, others are suffering worse. Your uncle only killed himself. He didn't die in the towers. That was when he knew he couldn't stay in America. He downed his IPA and said, only? Everyone was talking about death, but he had to keep quiet. He was filling a container inside of him. Into it, he put the things he couldn't say, about the seduction, forgetting. When his container was full, he would dump himself out in one dramatic move. A case in point. By the end of that week, he had broken up with his girlfriend and requested a leave of absence. On the tram back to Boston College from the birthday party, T remembered a word his uncle used to like, posturing. Why had that come to him now? His friends were not posturing. Was he? As a child, he thought of the word as a topographical feature. His uncle, the pilot, collected maps. There was one map his uncle liked best, a map of the wars in Eastern Europe. His uncle had called Prague a city of survivors, an older, less posturing Paris. T used to point out Prague on gloves before he knew what posturing meant, when he simply liked the sound of the word. He'd forgotten that. He could hear his uncle flattening the R, describing spires from above, the glow of roofs. He could feel his uncle toss him into the air, that first flight. He chose Prague for its resistance, a city where, for thousands of years, private lives had withstood the oppression of empires, both world wars, countless invasions, in the weeks before he left, he imagined hiding from the secret police, giving up his home to save his ideals. That was what he had to do. Resist, move on, leave the familiar behind. It would be his first trip on his own as he'd gone to college three miles from where he grew up. His first trip not counting his adoption. Prague might be the perfect place after all, a city that valued anonymity the desire to be no one and someone at once. He arrived in Prague in late December 2001 and met the artist and the artist's wife at the turn of the new year. It snowed that eve, once in the morning and again in the afternoon. After a late lunch, he took the metro, metro to the ruins of the original castle, Vishikrad. He carried a beer in each pocket. He'd pay $12 for a monthly transit pass, a dollar per bottle of Pilsner. Water costs slightly more than beer, a fact he liked to note in his emails home. <laughs> he didn't miss his friends, though. 
He wanted to be alone, free of expectations. He stepped out of the metro station and into the wind at the top of the hill. A hundred feet down the path, the walls stretched along either side, keeping out a long gone foe. At the far end, the Voltava ran below, a dozen feet lower than it would reach in August. He bent his head to an arrow slit, shrinking the world into a guardable space. He imagined an army advancing simply for something in their sparse world to take, or maybe to take something back. He imagined a little piece of himself held captive. He had been in Prague for five snowy days. The sun never came out. He wondered again if he should have gone elsewhere for a semester off. He'd enrolled in a certif certification course to teach English as a foreign language, but he was already skipping. What if the Czech kids saw his Korean half and had to know where he came from? Anywhere he went, he was the only Asian in Prague. The wind blew at his back. At the far end of the castle grounds, behind the Basilica of St. Peter and St. Paul, where the devil had lost a legendary bet for a soul, he stood for a while in the famous cemetery. He watched a boy return to the same statue over and over, a thin winged girl that couldn't have meant anything to him. He stepped back to give the boy room or to wonder unobserved. After the boy's father led him away, he touched the wings. They were scaly, almost reptilian. <coughs> He imagined the boy lifting those wings onto his own back, making a myth of himself. Later, he would learn about Queen Libouche, who sent out a white horse for Vishrad to look for a king, and found a man stooping under a doorframe that would eventually become Kafka's castle. After that king died, a maiden's army would fight the men for control of Prague. It's all true stories. Beside the cemetery was a prayer maze where the children knelt in the center and wished. T felt cold with history. He poked a finger in the snow and outlined a man and a woman, a baby slipping out of their arms. He climbed up and sat on the wall under the flat bottom clouds. Below, ancient armies had piled up dead, forever at the edge of what they wanted piece of brick scratched free under T's nails and tumbled toward the water. Okay, skipping ahead a little bit, he's gone back uh, into the city center. In a cafe down a side street, T let the caffeine wind his spring. He wondered how to make a start. Apply at the Prague Post, the local English newspaper, Work at an English bookstore, commit to teaching after all, write a novel, become a tea connoisseur. As if one of those tasks would open a door. By 10, he had finished his third cup. He trembled as he signed the check. In the dark, on the cobblestone, he didn't know which way to turn. He smelled smoke, heard a siren somewhere, his heart raced. After an hour, he stumbled upon the familiar glass doors of his hotel, as if by coincidence. No one waited inside. He remembered skimming over Boston in the cockpit of his uncle's water plane, so completely separate from the city below. In the glass door stood his reflection, the container inside of him filling. Finally, he made his way through a web of streets to a beer stall near Old Town Square. As he waited for a boudoir, he heard the explosions at last. He followed a woman a little older than he. When they reached the crowd, he saw the fireworks, not high up in the air, but shot horizontally down streets just overhead. He pushed through the mob under the Orloy astronomical clock, under the streaks that burst into sparks and ash. Inside his coat pocket, his fist tightened on a scaly feather. A stranger slapped his back. The Orloi rang in the new year with its famous dance of figurines. 
People sprayed champagne, shook hands, passed bottles, sang Czech folk songs, pulled him into crisscrossing arms. He drank anything he got his hands on, a liquor that tasted like Christmas, which he would later know as Bekarovka, a jam jar of homemade Slivovitsa. The champagne wet his clothes, stuck to his skin, and suddenly he wanted everything off. He felt dizzy with the idea of starting out clean of his past, like a baby dumping his container for good. He slipped off his shirt and stepped into a small opening where two businessmen shot industrial grade fireworks over Team Church. When he got down to socks and boxers, the crowd cheered him, the foreigner half naked. He swayed and shuffled to the side to catch his balance. Someone copied his steps, making a dance. Someone handed him another boot farm. He wriggled, trying to force the heat from the alcohol through his limbs. The wind stung his back. He drank and shook and drank and shook until, finally, the cheers faded, as if, in the end, he was only odd or sad. People returned to their circles, hands drew back. T shook harder. The glass bottle steamed in his palm as he kicked off his socks. A couple approached a shabby-looking man and a much taller, graceful woman, and waved him over. The man pulled a hood over shaggy hair and ducked under a Roman candle. The woman pointed at the sky and caught his gaze. He was going to cry, but why? When he had gathered his clothes, the woman turned to him with dizzyingly blue eyes and asked if he spoke English. We think you should be painted, she said with no introduction or self-consciousness. He picked up a fallen piece of a rocket as if it still had the energy for another burst. He added it to his pile of clothes, dusting them with ash, and followed her. OK, I feel like I've been reading forever, but one last short section. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. It is called The Hundred Year Floods, and I thought I should read something that had to do with that. In August, in Prague, the flood would seem a surprise. The storms came and went for weeks beforehand. Police and firefighters raised steel barriers along the embankments in Old Town, but left the Carling district unprotected. On the news, a former construction worker warned that buildings in Carling could collapse, built too quickly, with unfired bricks. An analyst predicted deaths and lawsuits the city surrendered its boundaries. Citizens defended museums and places of worship with sandbags. In the rain, an evacuation was ordered. The people thronged to bridges and riverbanks to watch. Sections of sidewalk buckled like tiny tectonic plates. Trees tipped over in the oversaturated soil and had to be tethered like barges. Metro lines were shut down too late to protect them. The river washed parts of other cities into Prague. The river pulled down levees, then buildings. The river washed parts of Prague into parts of Prague, then into the rest of Europe. From where T watched, in his second floor apartment, the flood made a high brown sea just below his window. He smelled the sewage in the water. He wondered how he had let himself miss the signs how strange the way we wade into disaster step after step, not realizing how far we've gone until we're drowning. Just before the flood, Katka had asked about Korea as raindrops formed fat planets against the window pane. Her finger followed the streaks across the class. A Korean friend told me once about his visits as a kid, she said. Everyone looked like him, but he still didn't belong. Kaka touched her temple where her hair met her skin. No one your age, she said, feels like he belongs. How did she really see him? His quick black eyes, the scar on his chin that toughened his boyishness, his flat cheeks and curved nose, the cream in his brown skin that seemed to make white people touch him without realizing. He was a believer, 
as Pavel Picasso had painted. In college, he had listed ambitions. Get a girlfriend. Be a writer. Drink more water. Fall in love. He believed in the kind of weight that could drag whatever fluttered in his throat down to more comfortable depths, a someplace or a someone. Kaka smoothed her hair and he said, you don't know what it's like to be adopted. People see you as who you were at birth, but you're not that person. At that point, the flood was still weeks off. He opened the window and caught rain in the cup of his palm. Kaka pulled his hand in, and for a moment he thought for some reason that she would lower her lips to the water and drink. She splashed his face. He pulled back in anger, but her grin conquered him. Thank you.